Ernst Rutherford was the first person to theorise and then prove that atoms aren't actually a plum pudding, so they're not just a solid sphere with electrons sort of stuck onto the outside, but he was the first one to prove that actually most of an atom is empty space. What he did was fire alpha particles at this metal leaf. Don't forget that alpha particles consist of two protons, two neutrons, that's a helium nucleus. What he found was that most of the alpha particles went through, they were transmitted. What does that prove? That proves that the majority of an atom's volume is just empty space. He actually found that some alpha particles were being deflected by more than 90 degrees. In other words, they were coming back on themselves. Rutherford calculated that if we model atoms as a circular target that the alpha particles are incident on, he calculated that if alpha particles were fired at this atom, then about one in 10,000 would be deflected. So he deduced that there must be a specific positive part of an atom, but also it must be very small if it only deflects one in 10,000 alpha particles back. So he said, right, well, I'm going to say it's in the middle and it's very small. If we call the diameter of our whole atom, capital D, and the diameter of this positive bit in the middle, this nucleus little d, the size of the whole target is going to be pi d squared over four. So we have the area of the nucleus, this positive bit divided by the area of the whole atom, but naturally all of these things cancel here. So we end up with d squared divided by d squared, same ratio, that's equal to one over 10,000. In other words, the area of the target of the nucleus is 10,000 times smaller than the area of the whole target of the atom. Anything that didn't hit the nucleus in the middle just went straight through. That's why he had most of the alpha particles being transmitted through this gold metal foil. One more thing that might come up is an idea of distance of closest approach. That means how close can an alpha particle actually get to a nucleus? All you have to do is take the kinetic energy of the alpha particle and equate that to the potential energy for the two positive charges separated by a distance r. That's going to be kqq over r. That r then is going to be the distance of closest approach. Since then, we found that a nucleus isn't just a positive lump, but it's actually made up of protons and neutrons. Don't forget that whenever we have an element, we have the atomic number, that's the number of protons, and we have a, the number of nucleons. Now, if we're talking about the size of a nucleus, then we're not really concerned about the number of protons because we have protons and neutrons in a nucleus. So if we have a helium nucleus, two protons, two neutrons, A is gonna be equals to four. So is there a way that we can calculate the radius of a nucleus? Now, because nuclei are generally spherical in shape, and it figures that, well, the number of nucleons is going to be proportional to R cubed. Let's put it the other way around. The radius of a nucleus is gonna be proportional to the number of nucleons to the cube root. Naturally, we need a constant in here, and we call this constant R0. Now, just to be clear, R0 is just a constant. Now, I say it's a constant, in reality it changes quite a bit, but at A level we are gonna call it a constant. This constant is in the order of femtometers, as is to be expected. What we really care about is comparing different nuclei. So if we rearrange this to make the constant the subject, then we end up with R0, equals the radius of the nucleus divided by the number of nucleons or the mass to the cube root. So we know that whatever values we have, that is always going to be true. Can we draw a graph of this? Yes, we can. So long as R is on the Y axis, A to the third is on the X axis. Yeah, we're gonna get a nice straight line where the gradient is equal to R zero. But there is a more useful way we can represent this graphically and that's by taking logs. If you don't know how to take logs, have a look at my proportionality and graphs video. Take the log of R, that's gonna be equals to the log of R zero, plus a third log A. So there's two log identities that we've used to get from here to here. So if we draw a graph of this now, 
we can have log of r on the y-axis, log of a on the x-axis, and again we are going to get a straight line, but it's not going to go through zero. The gradient of this is going to be equal to just a third, and the y-intercept here is going to be the log of r zero. Hope you found that helpful. If you did, then please leave a like. And if you have any questions or comments, then please leave them in the comment down below. And I'll see you next time.